the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So. That's right. And I, that's why I tell young people who don't know, they're like, man, I'm wrestling. What? Do, how do I know what God's will is for my life? And I just tell them, I said, man, just walk with him. He will open and close doors and direct your path. Just walk with him, you know, be faithful to follow him, worship him. And, and that all the rest of that will fall into place. You know, it's when we get caught up in doing what we want to do and following our own plans that we get into trouble. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Calvary Conversations. Uh, I am your host for this episode, Dr. Joshua Paxton, the director of the Burnham Center for Global Engagement. And with me today to just have a good time and some entertainment and share some stories is... Um, the 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 man the myth the legend uh my good friend james gleaves welcome james good to be here josh so i wonder if i built him up enough he's probably <laughs> embarrassed as it is so uh but anyway so well hello everyone so coming up next week is calvary's missions conference the conference on global engagement we've been i've been doing some interviews leading up to the conference with some different folks and today uh my james and i thought we would just have some fun and and share some stories from the field so james is a mobilizer with ethnos 360 formerly new tribes missions and he grew up on the missions field and then went through training went back himself and now serves the lord in helping others to go so uh if you haven't we do encourage you to take this opportunity to to register for our missions conference next week there's still time to do that and and join us at last count we had uh i just counted it this morning 50 yes 50 uh missions representatives who are going to be here from around 30 different organizations so it is going to be a great time come out attend some seminars on tuesday and wednesday and and just enjoy the opportunity of learning about you know what the lord is doing in missions and how how you might be able to join him in it so so james Oh, you know, you and I know each other well. We've had we've had a few 16 hour car drives and uh, I'm I'm repping my the podcast. People can't see it, but I'm I'm repping my Wyumi shirt today. Looking forward to taking some students back there again. But uh, let's let's kick it off. Just you know, what was it like uh, growing up as an MK uh, on the field and yeah how how was it just share your experience share some stories you're probably well, one of the best mission storytellers i know <laughs> well first of all i'm really excited about the conference uh next week and uh for the first time i get to have a colleague attend with me um who is a mobilizer for our aviation arm of ethnos 360 yes. so jeff worley's going to be with me next week so i'm really excited so if there's any listeners out yeah. there who really are interested in aviation and missionary aviation this would be a great this next week would be a great time to come and talk to somebody who knows a lot about that so but as far as my um experience um i i wouldn't trade my my mk experience for anything i it was just it was such a, a privilege to be able to experience living in another culture living in another country, uh, becoming bilingual, um, just, you know, being exposed to more than what we normally are exposed to living in in, in one culture, one country, one language. And um, I got to grow up in Colombia, South America, and my parents did a number of different things there. So I got to experience quite a, quite a wide array of different ministries too um, that my parents were involved in. Obviously, the most exciting one was when they were involved with planning a church amongst uh, an unreached people group, uh, which had never been contacted by the outside world. So that was you know, out in the middle of the jungle. That was very exciting, and a lot of my fun experiences and memories come from that time. So good. Well, without. Uh, so what was it like? Tell us, tell us a couple of those stories. Don't, um, don't embarrass your wife. Cause I know I've heard, I've, I've heard some things. Uh, but, uh, so what were the, 
if you're free to share, what was the people group again? And and what well, was it like trying to, to trying to reach them? Well, um, later in my time, I was there. My parents flew to Columbia on my 11th birthday. So I spent junior high and high school there. And um, and I got to experience, you know, attending a boarding school, uh, you know, a mission boarding school, right. which in my case was really it was a positive experience. I had a great experience and loved those years in the boarding boarding school. Now, our boarding school only went up through the eighth grade. So I only uh, I was only a, away from my parents for two years um, doing that, but I saw them lots during those two years. You know, we would have lots of times to go home and and visit our parents and everything. Um, so what one of the things that instilled in me that I I to this day I really value family time because when we mm -hmm. got to be together as a family we we made the most of it my mom and dad were really really fun and and Absolutely. always planned a lot of fun neat things to do to, together and so we had really precious special times together we got to you know the longest period of time we were ever apart was nine weeks and so when we would get together um we always did a lot of fun things my my parent my dad was very adventurous so we we always had fun trips and fun adventures and um so you know, I don't really feel like I missed out. In some ways, I feel like it it made me it made our family closer um, and made me appreciate family. You know, um, more. But um, then high school was a different experience because there was no high school. So I did hi high school through a, co a correspondence course here in the United States, and which. I could take those books wherever I wanted to go. So I took advantage of that and I traveled all over the country and I was in high school. So um, different missionaries would invite, you know, a couple of us high school guys to come and help them with work, whether it was building an airstrip or helping with a, the contact, like the new cock contact before my parents got involved um, with that work of trying to reach the new cock Maku people. Um, I got to had the privilege of going out there and helping, you know, cut trails and live out in the middle of this lake in the middle yeah. of the jungle and and leave, you know, leave gifts out and try to have some positive exposure to those people. And so then when my parents got involved with that ministry, you know, I was pretty excited about it. And uh, but, you know, just for a boy, the jungle is a pretty uh, especially a boy who loves the outdoors Mm -hmm. uh, living in the jungle was awesome, and uh, I, I loved it. You know, I have a ton of stories of hunting and fishing and all that boating and all those kinds of fun things in the jungle. So, yeah, yeah. So you came, you grew up on the mission field, um, went to New Tribes Bible Institute, but weren't really sure you wanted to go into missions. Kind of yeah. what what happened there? Well, God really got my attention in high school when my parents were, when I was involved with that new cock contact. I mean, you know, they were fearful of us. We couldn't explain why we were there. They, you know, they didn't speak. And so they would actually, you know, shoot poison darts at us and stuff. And so as a young, young man, that got my attention. And just the Lord really was doing a work in my heart. And so I, I really kind of at that point when I was 15 or 16 recommitted my life to the Lord. But I was certain because I had a love for math and I love uh, working with my hands and doing things. And, and you know, I, I just thought he wanted me to be an engineer. And so mm -hmm. um, sure. but I told the Lord I'd do whatever he wanted. My dad asked me if I would give him one year of my life and go to Bible college school before I went to college and started college. And so I, I, you know, agreed to do that. And my dad had definitely earned that right to ask me to give him one year. Well, I got into the Bible school that our mission has. At that time, it was called New Tribes Bible Institute. Now it's called Ethnos 360 Bible mm -hmm. Institute. But um, man, just getting in the in God's word and seeing God's heart for the nations and I just, I just couldn't get, I had seen the needs firsthand on the mission field and then just seeing yeah. how passionate God was or is for the nations. Just, I just, 
I just couldn't get it out of my head. And then the Lord, you know, he has a way of twisting our arm. And he brought this little blonde beauty into my life that had uh, had been, you know, convinced that God wanted her to be a missionary. And God, you know, used all of that. You want to marry me, you got to go to the mission field. Yeah. Used all of that to kind of redirect me. But I ended up staying the full two years. It was a two year program and loved every minute of it. And then we just pursued missions after that and went on to train with with uh, at that time was called New Tribes Mission. Mm -hmm. What are so New Tribes? I mean, so Ethnos 360 now, like we still have this problem. We're both (laughs) used to it being so. But uh, Ethnos 360, they have they have one of the most in-depth uh trainings of of any agency that i've ever encountered and i know a lot of mission agencies um in your in your opinion why do you think that's just so essential for for the ministry that they do well speaking as a missionary you know it was reassuring to know and to go and know that i had been equipped and had all the tools that i needed to do the job and do it effectively. And then not only that, but that ongoing as I, you know, continued on in in doing my ministry, that there would be people there to help me, consultants and ongoing training and and all that. That's one of the things I really appreciate, have have always appreciated about Ethnos 360 is just the preparation, the training, and then the ongoing help and ongoing training. Um, You know, people that have been there, done that, that are available to 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 really walk you through and answer questions and and you know we want our people to be successful and the best way oh, to help them, help them the best way to be to help them be successful is to give them the tools they need um to do the job and so um that's one of the one of the things that i think one of the unique things about um ethnos 360 that um i really appreciate as a missionary is just yes. the the preparation and you know it allowed it allowed me also as a young man to become more familiar with the organization that i was going to that i was committing my life to serve with now i had the added benefit of having grown up and and you know at sure. that time it was called new tribes mission but your perspective as a kid is totally different than it is as an adult and it was a yes. it was a good thing for me to understand what what they what the organization valued um what their you know purpose was and um you know all of that and and just become familiar with with the organization mm-hmm. yeah i always i i have a real i i have a real deep heart and a, an appreciation for mks but when i have my students do their um missionary interview assignment i always tell them they have to enter which you've done before uh i always tell them they have to interview a um you know, not an MK, but an an active career missionary because yep. they need to interview somebody who chose to the chose to go to the field rather than being yep. dragged there kicking and screaming. That's um, right, <laughs> or not? Maybe not so <laughs> kicking and screaming. But anyway, so uh, so you went through training and then you went back to the field yourself. So where did you go? What was your your ministry when you went back? Well, um, that's where it kind of got really interesting because our training, both my wife and I um, were apparently adept at 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 the at analyzing language and seeing the intricacies of how language works and and, you know, all that and and kind of the mechanics of language and doesn't necessarily mean we would be fast at learning language, but we just had the ability to kind of analyze it and see how it all worked, kind of the nuts and bolts of language. And so we were asked to stay longer than normal and get added training to in linguistics to be able to help, you know, our church planning teams um, break a language down, put it into writing, you know, give the people an alphabet, a phonemic alphabet, and, uh, and then, you know, help them learn to read and write their own language. And obviously that's necessary to do Bible translation and, and plant an indigenous church. So that was, you know, along hey, with just, the normal. Just, just pause for one second, because it always, did you catch that? Audio? Helping people to read and write their own language. It just, it yeah. just always makes me pause. Yeah. Yeah, so you know, most of these people, like for instance, the Newcock people, um, they're 
their language has never been written. And so you know, somebody has to come up with an alphabet for them. And there's a process to do that. And it's very technical. And if you ask, I mean, I think it's fun, you know, but some people would argue with that. But, uh, you know, for me, it's fascinating. And so um, our people that do that are, are, you know, have learned the process and go through that process to come up with a, a, a good alphabet that makes sense and will make it as easy as possible for those people to read and write their own language. And so, um, so we went to the field thinking that, oh man, we've had all this preparation to be church planners and be yeah. on a church planning team. But we got to Columbia and started, um, you know, getting better at Spanish. I had to kind of learn the nuts and bolts of Spanish. I could speak it, but I didn't know exactly why why you did things the way you did in the language. So I, I studied it as well as my wife. Um, but for her, it was, you know, she was learning a new language and, and everybody needed there needed to be able to speak Spanish because that was the trade language in the country. Sure. But um, while we were doing that, um, the leadership there approached us and asked us if we would consider helping out in the boarding home because they were starting a high school um, for the first time. And um, they wanted um, some high school boarding home parents and felt like my wife and I would be uh, comfortable in that position. And they mm -hmm. told us it would only be temporary. And uh, so we uh, we were pretty excited about that. We thought, wow, that sounds like a pretty neat opportunity to be able to pour into the lives of all these young people. And and uh, so we agreed to do it for, you know, temporary. Mm -hmm. And uh, but and temporary turned <laughs> into. Well, we we got to we got the end of our first term and we were getting ready to come back to the United States. So we had we'd been on the field for five and a half years at that point. And I remember we were at a field conference with all of our missionaries and I approached the leadership and I said, hey, you know, we're going on furlough. What should we tell our our, our supporters and our, our sending church? You know, our, what are we going to do when we come back? As you had said, this was just be temporary. Uh, you know, are you thinking, do you have something in mind? And they yeah. had this little panicked look like, what? Like they kind of took them by surprise. Obviously they had not continued to think of us as being temporary. And so they said, oh, well, do you do you not want to do this when you come back? And I said, well, we're happy to do whatever, but we need to know so that we, you know, we know what to yeah. tell people. And uh, by that time, we felt like we were in a good, a good place. Our missionaries all over the field had expressed to us how us providing a healthy, good home for their children made it easy for them to do their job and not worry about their kids. And and Absolutely. so we we had like nine or 10 or maybe it was eight or nine different church planting teams telling us that we were an integral part of their ministry. And so Absolutely. my wife and I just felt like, hey, there's value in doing this. And it's not what we had planned to do, but, um, you know, we're doing we're doing OK. And so it seems like so this is very what... real. I just I'm, I'm sorry, James, but just, you know, for our for our listeners, I mean, in a very real way, you you guys were fundamental to the planting of eight or nine tribal churches because yeah. your your ability to be there at the school and minister to to these kids you know, allowed the parents to be able to more effectively fulfill their role on the field. And it's it always strikes me as one of those things where, you know, it's not it's not like somebody is a second class missionary or something. It's like, no, 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 no. By by no means. This this other thing over here may have never happened. Had you not been in your place with doing your role yeah, and absolutely. that's missions right. involve so many different roles. And they all have to do their part yeah. if if the goal is going to be successful. Yeah, and that's, you know, we did have training in another role. But, you know, I talk to a lot of people that tell me, man, I just I'm not cut out to be a tribal church planner because I, I don't see myself and that's fine. doing linguistics. And, but maybe they're a teacher or a mechanic mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, a builder, or a, a maintenance person or a mechanic Absolutely. or a, a computer, you know, computer technician or a programmer an accountant. I mean, there's so many Absolutely. different ways to serve. And, you know, only about roughly, I would say half 
of our people are can be on the front lines. There's a lot of logistic right. people behind the scenes to make it possible for them to be out there on the front lines. And every single person is equally important to get the job done. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, so, so you guys, I, I won't ask you to regale this story because I know, I know you probably get tired of telling it, but you had a bit of an emergency situation and you were, you were forced to leave, leave the field and come back. Um, I mean, if you want to, if you want to tell people real quick that I'll leave that to you, we've got about six minutes left and, but then, you know, transition into, into this role as, as a mobilizer. And so, so what has that transition been like for you? Yeah, well, we we had we had been we had spent by that time ten years uh, working mm -hmm. in the in the with the high school, the boarding home. The last year, we actually um, had all ages. Um, the we had some security issues in Columbia, and we had to close down the school, um, which eventually led to our leaving leaving Columbia um, when with kidnapping became a, a problem in Colombia and and um and so that became a very um big problem for our for our ministry but um so there for one year we had all ages um because everybody else most of the other people had had to leave and we we did we were one of the few that were able to stay behind and and continue to help out but it it eventually just got to the point where it was it didn't make sense for us to stay either and we shut, kind of shut down the boarding home part. Um, we had already relocated it because of the security issues. But mm -hmm. um, we came home um, on a furlough, hoping to go back. But we are one of our sons had some medical needs, um, and while we were home getting him care, um, we were told we shouldn't go back overseas in order to get proper care for him. And so sure. that opened up a whole, you know. Um, a whole bit, the whole question of well what do we do now and what's next yeah. um yeah and and you know it's interesting god i i'm a hard, i'm a bit of a hard head he ha god has to slam doors closed to get me to move in a new direction but so he, he, did, he, he did that in a number of different situations to just keep redirecting us because eventually i ended up in the ministry i'm doing now which is the one ministry i told new tribes mission yep that I wouldn't do. I said, I'll do anything but be a representative. And uh, now I've been doing it for 23 years. So um, God has a way of, of uh, you know, accomplishing what he wants to accomplish, uh, not Man. only through us, but in us. And uh, so, and that's how I got to know you, Josh. So I'm I'm really I grateful. Had no in I had no intention of being a university instructor. 10 years later, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Yep, yep. So the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So. That's right, and I, that's why I tell young people who don't know, they're like, "Man, I'm wrestling. What? Do, how do I know what God's will is for my life?" And I just tell them, I said, "Man, just walk with Him. He will open and close doors and direct your path. Just walk with Him. You know, be faithful to follow Him, worship Him." and and that all the rest of that will fall into place you know it's when we get caught up amen. in doing what we want to do and following our own plans that we get into trouble yep amen amen and so 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 let's you know let's let's bring it bring it to a close you know guys you've you've been able to hear kind of the the life story of of james here and his his journey from mk to the field and and now serving as a mobilizer james um you know, if if there is just one or two things that that are really essential to you and in, in somebody who is thinking about going to the missions field and, you know, living this kind of life of of service, however it might change and wherever it might lead, uh, you know, what what is it that you would really want them to know? Well, the the one thing that has really been impressed on my on my mind the last um, year and a half or so is I, I, I in talking to a number of, of veteran missionaries who spent their life serving the Lord, um, mm -hmm. you know, and gave up a lot who are now with the Lord. The one thing one of them was my father. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I heard over and over again is just no regrets. 
no regrets, zero yeah. regrets. And yeah, um, I, my dad, even I, I remember talking with my dad, he just, you know, and, and talking with him, if he, you know, if he wishes he had done anything different. And, and I remember at one point he, he turned to me and he, we were actually fishing in a boat and he said, yeah, I, I, I would do something different. And I was like, no, I don't want to hear this, you know, <laughs> But then he turned to me and says, I wouldn't have waited until I was 33 to go to the mission field. I would have gone sooner. And I was like, yeah. OK, that's more yeah. like it. You know, that's what I wanted to hear. So really, for me, it's just I'm not saying that they that they that it, it means it's going to be easy. On the contrary, it, it, you know, there's times where it can be hard. Some of the things we went through as a family were hard. Oh, but absolutely. but, you know, how to finish your life and end your life and know that you made it count as as best as possible for for you know helping further the work of of our of our Lord and Savior of of you know making disciples um, and reaching the nations. Man, I can't think of anything better than being involved in that. Certainly, Amen. There are other things you could do, and 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 obviously be right in the center of God's will. But I would argue, could you go wrong being a missionary? I don't know. I seems like it'd be, <laughs> you know, how can you go wrong doing that? You know, so um, I don't my, know. That's just, my... of course, I, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit, uh, nope. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a little bit um, biased, but, you know, it's, uh, it, I know my dad sure didn't have any regrets. Amen. Amen, brother. So, well, James, that, uh, that's all we have time for. Thank you for, for joining me and, you know, sharing your stories. And those of you watching, you know, you, you've got time. So join us for the conference on global engagement next week. James will be there. Uh, he's got a few seminars that, that we've asked him to present. And so you get the opportunity to, to meet him. And yeah, I would just invite anyone who, who has heard his story to just you know, think about the joy that is that is so evident in in his journey. And even, you know, if you come and maybe you can interact with him and hear some of those difficult things they've gone through. But I know them and and yet the still the clear and evident joy that is that is all over James uh, story about serving the Lord. And so it's it's never wasted. Uh, absolutely. So. Thank you, everyone. This has been Calvary Conversations. We invite you to uh, join the, the conversations by uh, contacting us at calvary.edu. God bless. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Calvary Conversations, a service of Calvary University in Kansas City, Missouri. We invite you to participate in the conversation by contacting us through the Calvary University website, calvary.edu, or by calling us at 816 816- Three two two zero one one zero. Join us again next week for another Calvary conversation.